Eh, vamos a continuar con el programa de este Human Capital Forum 2014, edición Perú, y enseguida vamos a poder participar de una eh, presentación eh, muy interesante, un tema con mucha uh, proyección. Eh, esta conferencia eh, lleva por título Gestión de la Interculturalidad en la Empresa y va a estar a cargo de Luby Ismail. Eh, Luby es presidenta y fundadora de Connecting Cultures, es una eh, empresa eh, pionera y muy reconocida en los Estados Unidos en temas de gestión de la diversidad en las empresas. Así que bueno, les voy a pedir darle la más calurosa bienvenida con un fuerte aplauso. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Luby Ismail, el presidente de Connecting Cultures. Perdóname, no hablo español. Soy egipcian americana. So it is through my fine translator I want to say to you first, I love Peru. I love it. So let me tell you why and what I've learned before I came and now that I've been here. That first, Peru is the third largest country in all of South America. That you have a long history, a long legacy that is of a great empire's and cultures. I understood yesterday that there were, there are over 70, uh, excuse me, over six, 67 cultures in Peru. And based on your climate, on your environment, Peruvians have had to be great innovators and to be able to survive and to thrive with what has been perhaps the expected as well as the unexpected. So there's great potential for you as Peruvians. And in 2014, your country was chosen as the Traveler's Choice Award, that the world should know about you, should come to you. And so there's so much to love about Peru. Also, as a US American, USA Today selected your dish, ceviche, as the biggest food trend of all other dishes. So not only is Peru a place to come and visit, but to have your food. And in the last decade, over 500% greater in foreign investment in your country. So it's not just a place to come visit, but it's also a place to come do business. But what do you need in order to grow? What do you need to be even a better place to not only visit, but also to do business? I'm going to give you three things. One is diversity. Two is inclusion. And three, three is culture. And that's what I want to give you is how those three attributes can be critically important for the way in which you work within Peru, but also in engaging across cultures. So let's first look at diversity. How many of you saw the film Titanic? How many of you? Yes, it's a great film. What was in that film that led to the ship to sink. It was, what is the word? An iceberg. In Spanish, is it el iceberg? Right. In English, iceberg. It was an iceberg. So think about diversity like an iceberg, because we, as interculturalists, talk about the diversity iceberg, and that the tip of the iceberg are the aspects of who we are that we can see. So, for example, we can see our skin color. We can see our gender. We can see our ethnicity, our physical attributes. In some cases, we can see our disability, but not always. But it's underneath the surface, the part of who we are, 
that is unseen, that is far more significant. So if you look at the iceberg here, our socioeconomic class, our education, our thinking styles, our working styles, our strengths, our potential, those are aspects of who we are that we cannot see. That we cannot see. So being able to think about how do you get to learn and know more about the aspects of who one is. D diversity is difficult. Diversity can be dangerous. This is what you need to do, is to build an inclusive work environment. What does that mean? When people come to your organization, when they come to, to fulfill the mission in your organization and in your companies, people need to feel valued. They need to feel motivated. They need to feel that not only will they be heard, but also that their ideas, their ways and contributions will be leveraged. It's important to have people come and feel that they can bring their full self to your organization and to your companies. So what do you need to be order, in order to use diversity and inclusion to work for you? One thing, leadership. It's about you as managers and you as executives and you as people that your employees are watching to be able to, to, be able to show people how this is a benefit. And so what does that mean? Think about diversity and inclusion. What will that do for you? It will attract and retain the best people. It will also lead people to be more productive. Over and over and over again, studies have shown that heterogeneous groups or diverse groups not only will perform, they will outperform homogenous groups. But it has to be a place where people feel valued and feel motivated and to be engaged. And of course, what do you have when you bring a, a diversity of people is you also have them committed to the mission of your organization, which leads to the bottom line, the financial profits to your organization. But a greater and better business can lead to a greater and better Peru to benefit your beautiful nation. So what do we need to do? What do you need to have? There are many characteristics as a leader and as a manager, and I'm going to focus on one, because I want to focus on diversity and being competitive in a global market, is your intercultural competence. What does that mean? Sometimes it's referred to as cultural competence, cultural intelligence, but being able to have the awareness and understanding about your own cultural orientation and that of others, and being able to, being able to have the skills to understand how to engage effectively across diversity and across cultures. But it's hard, as good as it is for us, it's very difficult. So I'm going to give you a look at how to think about culture, because Peru is well positioned to compete in a global market. So first, I want to look at, I don't, I don't want you to look at that right now. We'll wait for a moment, if we can go back to the slide before. So think about culture. Culture is like an invisible set of lenses that all of us have. And through those lenses, we define what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's inappropriate, what's respectful, and what's disrespectful. 
My favorite definition is by a Dutch sociologist, Gert Hofstede. And in your materials, I've given you a lot of resources to be able to find more about what I'm sharing, but particularly about Gert Hofstede, who's one of the best in the world and looking at the engagement across cultures. So Gert Hofstede says, the mind is the hardware and culture is the software. And do you remember when we had the IBM PC and then we had also the Mac and they couldn't communicate with each other. They had to have the right software. Well, it's the same for us as people. So for you as Peruvians, when engaging across a diverse work environment, but also engaging a business across cultures. So when you might be meeting and greeting and negotiating and building a trustful relationship, you've got to switch your software. Because someone from China, someone from Indonesia, someone from Saudi Arabia, which, by the way, I want to see more Arabs in your country. Uh, and I hope maybe beyond this trip, uh, we'll, we'll find a way to bring more d uh, diversity of your customers. But my point is that thinking about how do you switch your software, that you can't say one style fits all. I believe you already do it, but I want you to be more conscious of how do you shift the way in which you engage with people across cultures. However, what do we face? Barriers. What are the challenges that might come upon us when communicating and engaging across cultures. So let's look, first of all, at this picture. What do you see when you see this? Some of you are smiling. You may have already seen this, see? Okay, so how many of you see a young lady? How many of you see an old lady? How many of you think the other person is crazy? How many of you see both? Okay. How many are thinking, I still don't see it? So if you look at this and look at the line across the image, then that's the lips of the old lady, right? But then if you think of that line, then it's the young lady. It's the necklace, and you're seeing her profile. See? Some of you are looking like, no. Some of you are saying yes and no. Being able to see the old lady, one more time, the line is her, fa her lips or a smile, a slight smile, and the line is... The necklace. So what? What does this mean? It's when you have people who have different, diverse experiences, diverse perspectives, that you'll be able to see both. You'll be able to see a multiplicity of perspectives. That's what you want. To bring the same people who think and look like you. You're just going to get the same old stuff. That's not, what, that's not about an organization, a business that's going to grow. That's going to grow beyond this year and beyond the next two years or five years. But thinking about 10 and 20 and 50 years, which is consistent with your incredible historical civilization of your country. So having people around the table who are wearing not just one lens, but having various ways in which they perceive the way in which you gauge, engage effectively across differences or across cultures. But there are barriers, right? So what are some of those challenges in communicating across cultures? Based on research, there are six major 
impediments or six major stumbling blocks to communicating across cultures. I am, my education is in intercultural communication. So I always want to not just tell you my opinion, but what research shows us. So regardless of the two cultures, be it Peruvian and British, be it Japanese and uh, Argentinian, regardless of whatever those two cultures may be, these are the major barriers to communicating across cultures. So let's look at the first one. Assumed similarity. What does that mean? The assumption that when I state, I want you to be a good worker, or I need you to be uh, respectful, I, need, I presume that you will understand it in the same context that I will. Let me give you an example. Do you all know Nike? Yes? When we're not at work, we're, we're probably wearing Nike shoes. Nike had an incredible marketing genius. And their market was North Americans, the United States. And they came up with this slogan called, Just Do It. Those three words, just do it. U.S. Americans went crazy with it. They were wearing it on their chest. They were wearing it down their, uh, their pants because it resonated with the cultural values of U.S. Americans because U.S. Americans are extremely what? About what I can do by myself, on my own, right? Americans say, I will get my degree in May. I will get married next year. Or I will divorce that man next year. <laughs> but as U.S. Americans, that we believe that we have personal control over our lives. So Nike thought, you know what? We want to grow our business. We want to go to Latin America. Of course, they recognized we needed to translate, right? So they did. They translated into the word Oslo. See? And my understanding was it was a complete flop. It did not resonate with the Spanish-speaking market. Why? Because Oslo implied what? Do in disregard of others. And that is so inconsistent with the cultural software of South Americans, of Peruvians, because what you value most is your what? Familia, right? Your family, your group. And that was so inconsistent with the U.S. American. So being able to understand the software of your customers is very, very important. So that's assumed similarity. I'm going to give you one more example. It is the orientation to time. Time and its control versus human interaction. U.S. Americans, they talk about, I need time. We're wasting time. I need, you need to give me some time. They even talk about wasting, uh, excuse me, killing time. You know, U.S. Americans, gringos, they're consumed with violence. And for cultures like South American, what's very important about time? You have more of it, right? And we're going to do business with each other. We're not going to be looking at our watches. We're going to get to sit and get to know you, to socialize, to engage with you is very important. So these are just a few, and in, my, in your handouts, you'll have far more explanations. So moving right along, let's look at the next barrier to communication across cultures, which is verbal language. It's the most obvious barrier to communication across cultures. And I wish I could have presented to you in 
Spanish because I know that when you're able to speak the language of the other that you're engaged with can be much more powerful. I am blessed that English, my first language, is the international language of trade. However, that could change, right? Some say in the next 10 years, it's going to shift and it's going to move into Chinese or Mandarin. How many of you speak Mandarin or Chinese? I know I don't. All I know is ni hao ma. But think about that. Again, as leaders and managers that you're looking at, not just today, but tomorrow and in the future, I think the United States is realizing, because they've been so entrenched in being monolinguist, it's hurting us because our population is changing tremendously. This is the Spanish-speaking population that the demographics are growing. So again, thinking about verbal language. The next one I want to look at is nonverbal language. Because even though we can speak, there will be miscommunication between us. How do we, over 80 to 90% of what we communicate is nonverbal. So how do we communicate nonverbally? Eye contact. Some cultures maintain consistent, direct eye contact. Other cultures, what do they do? They may look, and then they look away. They may look, and they look away. And then how might you be perceiving that? Think about facial expressions. This smile, what does that convey? I can tell you I do training for people coming from other countries to the United States. And some of those cultures, the, I ask them, what do you observe? And they say, these Americans, they smile to everybody. Hi! How are you? Oh, that's amazing. And some people are coming from other cultures. They're not accustomed. Who are you? I don't know who she is. Is she in love with me? Because in my culture, if a strange woman smiles to me, that means she loves me. And I'm telling them, sorry, the woman at Walmart, she smiles to everybody, not just to you. So thinking about facial expressions, hand gestures, being here in Peru, I've seen a great, much more using of the hands. Now I'm, I'm generalizing, but gringo, Americans, white, American man, how are you? Good to meet you. The hands never move, right? So thinking about your hand gestures. And the next one, I want, instead of to talk it, I want to have us f feel it. I'd like everybody, I know it's tight, but stand up, everyone, because I got to keep you awake as well. See, see, see. Okay. What I'd like you to do is find somebody next to you and share just for a moment what is your favorite food. So just for a moment. Just uh, find somebody, talk about your favorite food, and um, keep talking. Okay. Okay, now I want you to keep sharing with each other. Por favor. I want you to keep talking with each other, but I want you to stand touching toe to toe. I want you to stand touching toe to toe. See. Si. Okay, keep talking, keep talking. Stand touching toe to toe. Okay, okay, okay. Sit down, sit down.
So what is that? See, you can sit. So what is that space? Our space, our distance between one another. And when engaging in diverse work environments or communicating and engaging with customers across cultures, notice what you notice. Because as leaders, as managers, it's heightening your awareness of those aspects. I know as a U.S. American, we talk about our space bubble. Our space bubble. And U.S. Americans, if I had them here, they would stand at least an arm's length distance. Automatic. That's their cultural software. So for Peruvians, maybe it's not arm's length. It's a little closer, right? So what happens is you have U.S. American and Peruvian, and they're talking, engaged in a conversation. The U.S. American that wants to have the arm's length distance, so what happens? They take a step back, and the Peruvian takes a step forward, and the U.S. American takes a step back until this is the dance, the tango that they're playing, but they're not aware of the software. And then what happens is that U.S. American is up against the wall. And when they leave the conversation, they say, those Peruvians, they're so close, they're in your face. And it means negative. And remember, it has nothing to do with your intelligence, your capabilities, your competence. But that U.S. American is making a misinterpretation, and that's one of the stumbling blocks, tendency to evaluate. And then the Peruvian leaves and says, those U.S. Americans, they're so cold, they're so distant, right? That's the misperception of one another. And in business, making good feelings, having good relationships, is critical to business success. So those, the, so space, eye contact, looking at hand gestures, body posture, and space, as well as others. But those I want to focus on. All right, so now what I'd like to do is look at the... I believe the greatest barrier to communicating across cultures, which is our stereotypes and our assumptions and our preconceptions of one another. This in the United States is huge. Is there has been there has been growing awareness about our brains and that our brains are wired to categorize that we, back in the times, and I'm thinking after seeing uh, your history, that people had to make, an, in an instant, were you my enemy or were you my friend? Can I trust you or will you kill me, right? So our brain wiring is to make an immediate assumption of the other and to categorize. As a result, what occurs is we make those snap judgments they fall into stereotypes, and then we say, oh, those Asians, those Latinos, those men, those women, and we fill it in with our assumptions or our stereotypes. It would be fine if those stayed in our head, but they don't. When we may have an interview with someone, it may be things that we see at the tip of the iceberg, but also may, that we make assumptions about aspects of who they are that's underneath. And so for you as leaders, you must be aware of those tapes. And every single one of us have stereotypes, have assumptions that are placed on the other about anyone based on their heritage, their nationality, their culture, 
based on gender. We have a lot of stereotypes about men and women, don't we? Yes. So what can we do about it? I do not think we can erase those tapes. I don't. But I have six steps for you to think about in order to manage those thoughts that are playing in our head. The uncon being conscious of the unconscious. Being conscious of the unconscious. So first of all, acknowledge we all have stereotypes. When it, whenever I meet someone who says, I don't have any stereotypes about anyone. I treat everybody equally. I don't believe you. Because that's, those are the thoughts that are constantly playing in our heads. Acknowledge, two, is know what are my stereotypes. What are those tapes? What are those recordings that are playing when I am interviewing or when I am in a meeting, when I am in negotiation that are playing? then you can't erase it, but what you do is you learn to push pause, to push pause, to be able to stop and say, I don't want to, be kick, uh, to kick in to those tapes and those stereotypes, and then to be able to suspend judgment, to suspend judgment. So like in that situation where the American leaves and say, those Latinos, are those Peruvians, they're so in my face. That's very judgmental. And so be able to remove judgment, as well as the Peruvian to not say, those Americans, they are cold, they are distant. Learn more and then reshift the way in which you engage. It's very, very important is be able to push pause on those tapes. So for example, I'm going to ask you, as a woman, for me, I know that there are certain assumptions about women, maybe universal, but I'll say as a U.S. American woman, that I am weaker, that I am emotional, that how am I going to manage stress, uh, that uh, I am, am I really going to be able to lead a team when I have a family at home, right? Those tapes are playing. I'm really happy to see that there is, I think, as equal, if not maybe more women in this room today than men. Because I can tell you, even in the U.S., too often when I'm speaking to managers and leaders, I'm seeing predominantly men. But also, Let's talk about the most obvious of mine, which is this disability. That I know that there is a lot of assumptions about what I can and I cannot do because of those tapes that are playing. So what do I get? I get questions like, can you drive? Can you travel? Can you work? Do you work? Even that's the question. I have three children, but I've had people ask me, are those yours? Like what? I can't love? I can't carry? I can't give birth to children? The tapes that are constantly playing. So remembering, remembering to think about the other, the aspects of who you are, but also of of how you might be engaged with people from other cultures, with the diversity and uh, dimensions of who they might be. All right, so what do I want you to remember? Oh, I want to give you a test. That's right. I forgot about this. So you now, as managers and leaders, I've told you what you need to do. So we're going to have a contest. And there's going to be a prize at the end. All right, so I want to see how well you've been listening. I want you to watch this next clip. And in this clip, pay attention and count the number of times the ball is passed by the team in white. Comprende? 
So count how many times the ball is passed by the team in white. So let us watch. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Okay, how many say it was five? How many say it was 10? How many say it was 13? Yes, it's 13. So you're all right so far. You all get the prize. However, how many of you saw the dancing bear? Hmm, okay, only a few. I know you're thinking, what? What do you mean, dancing bear? All right, I'm going to give you a chance. I want you to watch again very carefully, but I want you to see if you can find that dancing bear. Okay, ready? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Now you see it. It's easy to miss something that you were looking for. So what does that mean? Is when we are in a diverse work environment and we are expecting certain things, right, from certain people, that we have perhaps a narrower perception or perspective because we don't have the multiplicity of experience around the table in the organization. Remember what I said about our cultural lenses to be able to have people who don't just think and see and work like you because it would be very boring and but also it will not lead yourselves to be able to outsmart, let's be honest, with your competition. And so thinking about how and who's in your office, in your business, that's going to see that dancing bear. Because we are conditioned, right, to only focus on perhaps one or two dimensions of one another. So I want to remind you of the main pieces that I've tried to convey to you. Number one, diversity is the aspects of who we are that we can see, but there's far much, there's much more about who we are that we don't. And so diversity is diverse, but to be able to embrace it requires what? to build an inclusive work environment where people feel that they can bring their full selves, that they feel they are valuable, they feel that they are heard, they feel that their difference will be leveraged. And then remembering the barriers to communication across cultures. So I want to end with a story. When I was asked by managing events to come here to Peru. I was excited. And what is the one thing first people hear? If you go to Peru, you have to see what? Macho Picchu. And I said, I'm going to go see Macho Picchu. So I took the train and then I took the bus shaking go round right and I got to the top and I got out I got my scooter and then what did I come up to I came to a step a barrier 
And suddenly, I couldn't go any further. And I wanted to see the temple. I wanted to see what this great civilization of the Incas had created that till now was of such dismay of their power and their brilliance and their intelligence. Suddenly, what I found, though, was there a team of people around me. And I had an Australian. I had someone from a, uh, da uh, the Dutch. Uh, I had a U.S. American. And, of course, I had two Peruvians. And we all, even though we all didn't speak the same language, so we dealt with verbal language challenges, I was trying to use my arms to tell them what I wanted to do and how I wanted to get there. And we, could, we suddenly realized, let's try to work together as a team to overcome the barriers, the verbal, the nonverbal, to be able to commit to the shared mission now. Because suddenly I had strangers who felt compelled to fulfill my mission was to be able to see Machu Picchu. And then at that point, uno, dos, tres, lift me. Uno, dos, tres, lift me. Uno, dos, tres, he carried me. And suddenly, I was there at Machu Picchu. So... So I think for you all in your companies and in your organizations, but in your country, you have a long legacy of greatness. Use your diversity and create an organization where people want to come and they want to give the best of who they are towards your mission for success. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have uh, a time for some questions. Uh, okay. Anything about diversity? inclusion, around communicating, whatever you would like to ask, please do. Buenas tardes. En una cultura tan diversa como la peruana, ¿qué rol juega el tema de la tolerancia hacia el otro para poder aprovechar estos conceptos que usted ha compartido con nosotros? Uh, if I can ask the translator to say it one more time. It's absolutely critical that you cannot have a culture, a company, that is going to pit you against me regardless of the dimension of diversity. As you saw, the aspects of who we are, that we see, or versus what we can't. And where that begins is in a mission statement that really speaks about the value of all that come to our workplace. In the materials you have, I have given you one best practice, which is MasterCard. So you will see on their website an example. And the first thing that starts is that the CEO, not the lower level managers, but from the president, speaks about diversity and the importance of inclusion. 
Lou Gertzner of IBM said, diversity includes everyone and excludes no one. And that's where it begins. See, we have one over here. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Eh, normalmente en las organizaciones, eh, el área de recursos humanos desarrolla actividades para unir a sus trabajadores. Actividades de recreación, actividades culturales, y muchas veces las hace de manera uniforme. ¿No consideraría usted interesante o atractivo que así como se utilizan herramientas de marketing para conocer a los consumidores y desarrollar productos a la medida, herramientas similares se deberían de considerar para conocer esa diversidad en mis trabajadores, esa diversidad en mi organización y desarrollar actividades que reflejen de alguna manera esa diversidad en mi organización y mi personal pueda percibir que la organización se interesa en él como persona y no como grupo o como masa? Absolutely. When you think of your customers, do not think just of your external customer, but your internal customers. Those are your employees. And for you to be able to build strong relationships from within is where you begin. Remember I told you that based on research, heterogeneous or diverse groups will outperform homogenous groups or people who are all the same. But two things, two things are required. One is skill, developing their capability, their competency. Two is time. And I can tell you, because I've worked with companies like Walt Disney World, I've worked with Nike, most recently, I've worked with Darden restaurants, that is uh, Red, Red Lobster, Olive Garden, I don't know, I, I'm not sure if they're here in Peru. And the biggest flaw is U.S. Americans are focused on, we want immediate results. And I say, if you're serious about business here, you must invest in much longer time in engaging in that country, but also in your workplace. And training your internal customers are as important as gauging with your external. That's where you're going to get more productivity, and that's, gonna how it's, that's how it will be resulting in the bottom line. So the business case is there. I'm finding in the United States we no longer have to say, why diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency is important. Because they're recognizing they don't have a choice if they're going to be able to stay in business. But it starts with your internal customers, your employees. Um, buenos días. Buenos días. Um, Or buenas tardes. Buenas tardes, casi. Uh, es eh, la, te la tecnología de las comunicaciones y los negocios ha permitido conocer con mayor facilidad y, y rapidez la diversidad de culturas en el mundo. Sin embargo, paralelamente a ese conocimiento, increíblemente, vemos muchas manifestaciones de exclusión, de división, nacionalismos, eh, 
y exclusiones y, y rivalidades que llegan a la violencia con raza, sexo, eh, en fin, creencias. ¿Cuál es la explicación que podrías darnos acerca de esta aparente contradicción? At the very basic level, we are wired to be tribal. And that the sense is that not only thinking of my cultural lens, but my people, and who am I more comfortable with, are people who are like me, right? And there is as much effort to build an inclusive and diverse workplace, I spoke to you about the difficulties. In the United States, we are multiracial, multi-faith, multi-national in origin. I want you to know that I am Egyptian, American, I'm also a Muslim. And after September 11th, it's been very difficult for me because suddenly Muslims are being put as if they are not American. Even though I'm born and I'm raised here, my children, when we think about home, it's the United States. But there is, based on not just our brain wiring, but our conditioning, our socialization that places you against me and anything that is different from myself that I'm not familiar with poses that sense of fear and that sense of discomfort. In the United States, even though we say no discrimination based on race, age, ethnicity, religion, people still will have the tendency to discriminate. But here's the difference. When it's the law that says you cannot discriminate against me based on these dimensions of difference, then I have the legal justice system behind me. Because some people will never change. I know there are certain people that will, no matter what, not accept a man named Barack Hussein Obama as the United States president. But that we have a constitution and that we have a legal system that gives everyone the right doesn't mean that we're perfect. And I think in our organizations, where people can't, you can choose where you want to live, you can choose who you want to marry, but you can't choose who you're going to work with. So when you come into the company, it's being able to think of how you can get people to break down the barriers that puts you against me or the sense that you're different than me, I'm better than you, and to be able to have that leader, that manager, the climate of inclusion. I'm an idealist. I always say in the end, you can talk the talk, but if you're able to walk with heart, regardless of what language, regardless of what nationality, that people can feel your heart, that sincerity crosses cultures. And that's what I try to do in my business, is to be able to see the person, the human behind the labels. Because suddenly then, you're not just Jose or, uh, or uh, Silvia. Uh, you're not just the Peruvian and I'm the American but you're the person behind the label. So it's being able to get people to relate to one another, to shift 
out of those stereotypes and those assumptions of one another. Any other? And if you want to get more detail about getting up a Machu Picchu, come see me during the break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Presentación. A ustedes los invitamos a servirse el almuerzo, por favor, en la sala contigua, la sala C. Eh, está saliendo a mano derecha sin salir de este salón, ahí va a encontrar la puerta. Los esperamos eh, 2 y 20 aproximadamente para continuar con el programa.